Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells, guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our Trub Club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. Thoroughly cleaning filthy kegs, necessary headspace in the fermenter, and buying slash storing bulk liquid malt extract. This is Homebrew Happy Hour, episode 297. Well, hello there, and welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com, click on that submit a question link at the top of the page, or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. I am your host, Joshua Steubing, but today I am joined by my regular co-host. He is the uh, director of operations at cmbecker.com down there, Mr. James Carlson, hey, hey. as well as the president and chief keg washer in the cool green surly t-shirt. I like that. I was there when you got that. Mr. Todd Burns. Gentlemen, how are y'all doing? Good. Good. Surly. Did you... That's uh, that's Minnesota. Um, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's Minnesota. Because the last yeah. time we were up there, that I was up there, was for Homebrew Con. But you've been up there since then, right? So, I mean... Uh, I think you, I think you yeah. did a vendor yeah, visit we there. we were there for the... Uh, we were there. The, y'all were the, there? Oh, uh, CBC. Right. Yeah, CBC oh, was there. Josh, we didn't take Josh. Shut up! You know you didn't. Um, <laughs> but not only did you not take me, you may have gotten that shirt then. Actually, now that I think about it, I don't know. I did. Yeah. Okay. I, did. <laughs> I always I spoke he, to. He s- does that to you so easily. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I, I it was a softball though, James. I I set it up. <laughs> I said, wait a second, wait, you have been there since I was with you. Oh, yeah. He loves doing that to me when y'all when we're talking about Germany. Oh, he loves it. He'll, you know what? You're getting so close on the website, you may be able to go. I there. know. Oh, <laughs> like like end of month is it's gonna be for CM Becker. Uh we are doing a partnership thing with CM Becker Schankenlagen, which is our uh like where our manufacturing happens at in Krefeld, uh, Germany. And uh, we've been working on sandbecker.eu for for many, many moons. And it's finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Don't roll your eyes. Well, Did- moons would, you know, moon is a month. Is it? Oh, is moon a month? Yeah, uh, a moon yeah. cycle, I think, is a month. Isn't that right? Oh, then many moons. Then yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think what we're talking about here is years. That's also, listen, man, in marketing, you got to do the spin of optimism. And my spin of optimism is it's been many moons because that sounds better than you're right. Many years. Yeah, it has been like three years <laughs> or four years. COVID doesn't count, though. I've learned that uh, recently. People say that for a lot of things like, oh, yeah, I've been doing this for like a year, but COVID, so it didn't count. Like, with everything. Someone did that to me with their diet. They're telling me like, well, I normally eat healthy, but you mean during COVID, you know, and that doesn't count. I was like, I think your body still processed it in a negative way. I do think it counted, but anyway. Mine was all positive, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, whatever. Let's give the people an update. Poor Todd that got his MRI results, and you said it wasn't looking good, right? Hey, that's a HIPAA violation for you to <laughs> reveal my medical <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right i'm sorry i crossed the line here's his social security number his cell phone his, no you actually you do give out your cell phone but no your your neck you've been having neck issues and i f- thought at first you may have been faking it because you've been having me do a lot of heavy lifting at the ranch yeah when i'm up there but uh, it's legit yeah. so uh, yeah i've got another uh another disc that's out it looks like I, I don't know i have i'm gonna go pick up the report right after this call I mean, right after this podcast, right after this yeah. episode, as Th- you like to say, it's to the same podcast. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Todd knows it gets on my nerves, but but not in the way that makes you happy, but in the way that also annoys you because I correct you every time because the, the show 
is a podcast. What we do every week is an episode, Todd. It's an yeah. episode of the podcast. You're- well, I think we're going to have a p- good podcast today, so let's <laughs> get right into it. Uh, let me ask James real quick before we get to that. You you hung out with our, our buddy Clay uh, recently. Yeah. What did he say about, is he, is he going to come down and, and come on the show soon, sooner than later? Can Every time I ask him, he says, sure. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, he did make us some uh, beer coasters with his laser machine, and it's got the Homebrew Happy Hour logo on it. It looks pretty cool. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Yeah, he's got a 3D machine, and then he's got a laser cutter, and uh, it's pretty cool. I The week of October the 6th is when we're recording episode 300. I think it's going to be that Tuesday night, or more realistically, that Wednesday, the 5th. And we're going to do it at the ranch, and we're, we're going to have a healthy amount of, of booze and, and celebration as we record. Do you think he'd be down to come party with us then? And, and maybe he could crash there because it's... Yeah. Not yeah, the, give him... Uh, after this, hit him up. Yeah. You said what weekend? So the week of... Uh, so like Wednesday, October the 5th is when he should come to the ranch. He probably has to work. Well. Oh yeah, pe- real people have to do that. That's right. Yeah, Ugh. yeah. Ugh. major inconvenience for a lot of people. A major inconvenience for a ton of us. Uh, well, as James, yeah, reach out. Just tell him you're right, Todd. If he, well, if he has to work, we'll we'll work around him for a different episode. Yeah, a different time if we have to do a recording with him remotely, even because I'd love to have him on talk about. Is he still brewing? He's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, he's doing a lot of different things. He's got his toes in many pools. Yeah, so we'll have him. We'll have him on. Uh, I'm trying to look at ep- obviously episode 300 coming up. I would love to have y'all's feedback in our voicemail. People at home watching on YouTube or through whatever podcast app you're using, you can use three two five three zero five six one zero seven. Give us some feedback of the last 300 episodes. What's been your favorite moments? What's been your least favorite moments? Um, who's your favorite co-host? Whatever you want to de- tell us about the show that you've enjoyed or not enjoyed as opposed to leaving it as a one-star review leave it as a voicemail uh I, we'd love to play all your feedback uh for episode 300 it's crazy to me that 300's coming up i feel like we just did 250 i feel like actually i feel like we just did episode 100 from my office when i shaved my beard and <laughs> yeah i uh someone did ask me through our instagram if i was going to shave my beard again i said no because then i won't have any hair on my head and i'll look like an alien are you oh that'd be cool you should shave everything <laughs> even more of an egghead look at this head just I, ha- we should ha- shave your whole body yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would oh that would be youtube gold you want to talk about demonetization like that yeah i who was it that uh who was it recently i won oh it was your brother it was last year recently gosh it was was it last open weekend opening weekend or two that i won that five dollar bet about who's hairier yeah you, i don't it was a long time ago i think it was several years ago i finally won a bet it was against his brother though yeah. no it, it wasn't it against was you. uh on a technicality it was because his wife had just groomed him i don't his, care. no his she yes yeah, she had him uh what do you call it when they waxed yeah. waxed yeah, yeah. she had him waxed God. yeah i still won oh here's the other five dollar bet i i, I want to talk about todd and i made a five dollar bet that i won't lose any more five dollar bets for the rest of this year james that that's yes. <laughs> So if he loses another five dollar <laughs> bet, he owes me ten bucks. <laughs> but here's the trick: I just have to be disciplined to not bet him between now and December thirty first. Uh, twice already, he's gone. You want to bet five dollars? <laughs> then I'm like, yes, and he's like, no. I know, I know, because we we do agree the bet has to be a a handshake, or if we're doing it digitally, we have to just say yes. We both agree because I say it way too easily. I'm impulsive with that. Uh, I, he'll say something, I go, that's wrong. He go, no, it's not. And I'll say, you want to bet five dollars? <laughs> wait a second. Wait, no, wait. Um, also, oh yeah, we're celebrating my uh, daughter's three year anniversary from her successful craniotomy. We're doing that this Saturday and I have delicious beer from Mr. James Carlson on tap. Sweet. I have to thank you. We have, uh, I took that keg of Kolsch home and then your pressure pills, which I think I've told you in person. I don't remember if I've said it on air. It, one of my favorite beers you've brewed in a while. And you told me it was one of the most straightforward ones you've brewed. Yeah. A real simple grain bill, uh, single hop edition. And I think we did the, uh, I don't remember what we used that new yeast, didn't we? Todd? You did Todd. the dry, yeah. you used the dry yeah. yeast. Uh, um, oh, who makes it? Gosh, darn it. 
No, no, um, Lollamans. Is it is no, a lot? Lo- no, it wasn't. No, it was Lollamans. The- no, we I got don't- it from Brewmaster. It's a new new German. Oh, strain. oh, you're you're not talking about the Kolsch. You're talking mm-hmm. about the uh, the f- pressure fermented beer. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's why uh, it's basically. I mean, it's thirty four seventy, but a different company. Thirty four seventy, but yeah. Yeah, and it turned out great. My pop and I love it, James. So we have that on tap. We still have some of your wheat lager on tap. We still have uh, some of Todd's IPA on tap, and so and then the Kolsch. It's going to be a good party, and it's kind of cool. the beginning of Oktoberfest that weekend. Saturday the seventeenth is the beginning of Oktoberfest, so that's going to give me celebrating my daughter's anniversary and Oktoberfest is going to give me reason. It's just, it's gonna be great. Oh, and, and, and we got a water slide. Nothing's more fun than buzzed water sliding. But uh, <laughs> got that. Oh, let me before we get to the questions and, and listener feedback that we have planned on the show. Let me put it up on the screen. Boom! There it is. Y'all can't see it, but y'all have seen it before. Todd's ESB is this month's Trub Club recipe for those who receive recipes in our Trub Club. I think I fit all the words in there. You can go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. Join one of the recipe receiving tiers and you're going to get this delicious recipe. And on the instruction sheet, you're going to get that super cool artwork. Every time I switch from one screen to the other, it puts all of our little bumpers on the screen. That's hilarious. Um, (laughs) It wouldn't be a show if I didn't screw something up. It, it, It wouldn't be a work day. Todd called me this morning and said, hey, you, hey, you got to replace my coffee carafe. And it turns out when I left headquarters yesterday to head home, I left, uh, what, a slither of coffee and um, and it, it, it cracked the carafe. I don't even know what oh, happened. And I, didn't even, I didn't even have any coffee at home. I was like, ah, oh, coffee, coffee, coffee. And I come in, and I'm like, ah, oh, God. Yeah, I broke the carafe. But but I'm a, I'm, I'm a stand-up guy. I ordered a replacement carafe, and it's coming there Monday. Yeah, yeah, you sure did. I appreciate that. That's right. I just wanted you to admit that I'm a stand-up guy. Okay, so we do actually have an episode lined up for those who have stuck with us this far, 10, 12 minutes in. Uh, But before we get to our three questions for this week's episode, we do have some listener feedback from our buddy Adam in Florida. So that means... Hey, Josh. uh, Oh, no. Before I play it, I have to... Well, I'll do it. It's time. Listener feedback. feedback. (laughs) I keep screwing up. This listener feedback, like I said, is from our buddy Adam from Florida. Hey, Josh. Uh, Todd and James. This is Adam down here in Florida. I have a little listener feedback for you guys. Um, got me to thinking when you were talking on the late, latest episode about rice holes, adding those to various um, mashes and so on. Uh, well, I brew with a grain father, and sometimes... Uh, Depending on how I milled my grain, I could get it a little too fine and have some issues with that. I also have the new uh, grain father plates in there that uh, don't have the silicone rings on the edge. They're much heavier, and it tends to compress the grain a lot more. Um, so I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to make a recipe I've made tried and true over and over again, and I'm going to throw a pound of rice holes in the mash, and I'm going to see if this improves my efficiency. So in the past, uh, this particular beer style that I made, I usually get uh, around one, 1.048 for uh, gravity, pretty consistent within a point or two using this, just a simple uh, 12 pounds of, uh, or t- excuse me, 10 pounds of uh, malt, uh, Fireman Barca Pilsner. And then I usually change the hop. I keep it real simple. But anyway, I added the pound of rice holes to it this time. My gravity shot up to 1.060. So I'm going to use rice holes here in the future because guess what? I think it's uh, improving my efficiency. That costs next to nothing. And uh, it just seems like it, uh, sparge water flows through a lot easier uh, and a lot uh, uh, smoother. And uh, I'm going to keep giving it a go. Take care, guys. Bye. Great feedback. And yeah, if, if it's working for you, right? That's what we always say with whatever the process is. You're getting more efficiency uh, than, than do what you do. What's netting the results that you want. Right, James? Oh, yeah. I think that if you're able to get the, 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 the grain bed to flow more evenly, that's going to do nothing but raise efficiency. 
And he's talking about on the grandfather. I have found a, a, the Jonathan Marut, our buddy who is yelling at the monitor every episode that I, I say something about pressure fermentation or rice holes or something. He, he also, I believe, uh, the drain fathers when he realized the difference in efficiency that he gets. So it, it's also about systems, right? Like y'all on the brow tog, J- Todd, have you ever used rice holes? I guess you maybe yeah. on, on just big bodied beers or or when yeah you- i used them uh on a beer fairly recently i put in fact i kind of put too many and i almost almost overflowed the kettle by the time i was done but uh yeah i've, I've definitely used them but and you did that because you would have had a stuck mash otherwise well, Not- well i don't i mean i don't know that i would have but i, I was using a lot of like uh Rye. wheat and uh let's see i used wheat and oats it was the hazy ipa Oh yeah, your favorite beer on tap right oh, now, oh, and, and you couldn't have had that if it wasn't for rice holes. Yeah, you're a rice hole, uh, James. When you <laughs> when you made that delicious wheat pilsner, did you did you use rice holes for that because of the wheat, or is the brow? Yeah, tag it was just it's good insurance. It's uh, rice holes are cheap, and I added a couple pounds to the. I think I did fifteen and fifteen, fifteen of pills and fifteen of white wheat, and a couple pounds of rice holes. And that's and a- uh, mashed it at 150, no, 148 for a little over an hour, sparged it. And then I use German tradition hops, five ounces at the 60. That's it. Yeah. So straightforward and so yep. delicious. And I was at a, a good time to make fun of Todd. There is a bag upstairs. Y'all were like, uh, Todd was like, we have a ton of tradition. It's up there. Go find it. You labeled the bag of tradition, Todd, as spalt. It's your third grade handwriting it says underneath <laughs> it spalt um it's tradition i okay. promise you. yeah is it okay. oh yeah a hundred yeah it's absolutely tradition uh i because I, I needed it because I, I was bagging well, what is it what is it called on the uh it says uh german select i believe is yeah the, it's a generic title on it but there was no other bads of tradition so it had to be the tradition okay. i opened it and we had an old bag of tradition on the shelf that i didn't want to use and their smell was almost identical so i'm my using my sherlock holmes deductive reasoning i'm pretty sure i mean you know what you actually might be right it might be spalt i'll bet you five dollars it's tradition but <laughs> okay wait oh now i'm now i'm terrified Never mind. Let's move on. Adam, that's great feedback. I got to get this show going. So I, I'm, I'm on the, uh, I'm on, I went to their site real quick and it says German select hops. And under that, it says German spalt select pellets. Well, then where you told me you have a quote crap ton of tradition. That's what that's. Well, no, let me back up. That's oh, no. probably my fault. Oh, no. I saw German select. And uh, that's what I've been so using. So we did bet five dollars, right? You no, said, no, no, no. I, I backed out. You. No, I backed out. You, you said I want to bet you, and I agree. Nope, I backed See, out. See, that's no, the thing. Um, I think if you if you're the one that says I want to bet, and I agree, then you're in the bet. Uh, going forward, okay, but that one, <laughs> that, that, that one, I get a freebie. I, I get a free ride. <laughs> Sorry, James. <laughs> yeah, no, you're starting that's to piss t- me that's, off. That's totally my fault because I'm the one that said that. Uh, see I, when I, you, was, you know we, yeah. we placed the order on that that's what i thought we were ordering it was the german tradition i'm but it, on there too i'm looking oh no no worries uh, i'm just like i mean th- those for what i was sending out th- they worked fine i just needed a, a noble hop well if it's falter this whole time and i'm thinking it's it's uh, select then or a tradition then i need to change my recipe and put spalt and Select. keep using it, in my humble opinion, because you're yeah. you're banging out some crazy good beers. So I don't see that here. Uh, German Select Hops. Uh, I, I just went to the and more that's beer Hops side. Direct. Uh, no, more beer. Oh, oh well, that was more beer. Oh, I thought it was Hops. Oh, Direct. Oh, that's right. No, yeah, that bad that he had was the Artisan Select or whatever series. Either way, people at home are getting bored. So yeah, Adam, thank you so much for the feedback. I'm going to segue us as they're looking into that to our first question of this episode. It is a voicemail and a good time to remind you, like Adam left in his voicemail and like Matt is doing with our first question of the episode, if and when you leave us a voicemail to 325-305-6107, you get a $25 gift card to kekkenetchen.com. All other submission, all other ways you can submit questions, text, email, direct message, whatever, you still get a fifty. $15 gift card, which is pretty good in my opinion. So let's get our question from our buddy Matt from Nebraska. 
Hey guys, Matt in Nebraska. I made the mistake of purchasing used kegs from a notkegconnection.com supplier. When I open these kegs to dump them and clean them, inside at the bottom was a bunch of slimy, nasty mold, and in one of them was also a wasp nest complete with flies and uh, long dead wasps. My question is, what do I need to do to clean these to make them sanitary and not kill people with uh, the serving of my beer and uh, I'm assuming replacing the O-rings and everything like that. But yeah, any any ideas, suggestions, or should they just be uh, uh, thrown into a volcano? Also, um, <laughs> really nice things about Josh. Thanks, guys. Matt knows how to get his question on the show. I think I reached out to him for his $25 gift card to say the really nice things about Josh Parr ensured your insertion on this episode. Um, I, I, I will say, obviously, he's being a little facetious and hyperbolic, but there is no, has there ever been a mess in a keg, Todd, that you weren't able to confidently clean up and use that keg? Oh, I've seen staining in kegs that wouldn't come out, but it wasn't like that it was bad. It's just some chemical reaction with the metal and it was fine. But yeah, I've been able to, we, we, I mean, we've seen everything in kegs. I've seen, I've seen dead rats in kegs. Yeah. I mean, everything, but the thing about it is it's stainless steel. Uh, so you, you know, you want to clean it, of course, very well. If you've got all that stuff in there, I would use. I would use, you know, we usually use about a tablespoon or two of brew clean. I would use a, if I had one that bad, I would use a lot more, uh, you know, maybe a half a cup or something, get really hot water, put it in there and let it sit for, for, for a while, not just an hour, but maybe several hours. And then also once you dump that out, you know, you may want to scrub it a little bit, like get a stick and a scouring pad and scrub it if you're, if you're having some trouble. I mean, if you got one that's where you're like, it's disgusting, you know, but what you'll find is you'll get that keg clean and, and it'll just be bright stainless down there. And, you know, but you may want to, of course, you sanitize it and do that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, you can get them clean there. It's just stuff in there and it's stainless steel. And if you get it clean, it's clean. I mean, uh, like it's kind of like a kitchen sink. There's a lot of disgusting things in kitchen sinks from time to time, but uh, you can always get them cleaned up. That's a that's an excellent comparison because you're right. There, the things that I've seen, my kids leave dishes in their rooms. We don't discover it for days or weeks later, and then you ha you know clean it in the sink. You're right. My sink has seen some disgusting things. But with that being said, have you you would get your sink clean enough to where you would feel comfortable? plugging it, filling it with water and scooping the water out and drinking it out of your hands. I mean, like, like, yeah, okay. Cause, absolutely. Cause that's the only thing in the comparison I could think of is like, well, a sink though, you're not usually using it to consume, but, but you're right. The, the premise of what you're saying is absolutely spot on that the keg being stainless steel can have some grodiness to it, but still be clean to where it's perfectly acceptable and, and sanitary. That's the ultimate goal is to, that it's actual sanitary, right? Yeah. Exactly. Now, what are some of the misconceptions people have? Or here, how, let me actually say the ones that I get in emails. You talked about staining. A lot of people see staining even after they clean it. And I know it can bother people, especially those who have a OCD or something like, no, I, I need it to be spotless. But has staining ever led to infections or leaching of flavors in your experience on kids? No. Right? I mean, they're, they're, they're just visual. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, well, I mean, the ones I'm talking about are visual. I'm sure you could, I mean, if, if you had a stain that had organic matter in it and it oh. was, <laughs> it was, it was, you know, I mean, it's, there's a difference between the stainless getting stained and you having something on there that's stuck on there, right, you know I mean? Right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worried about it at all. Since I've worked for you, which may of next year will be 15 years, Mr. Burns, you've always been a proponent of thoroughly cleaning kegs and obviously doing the pressure test before you ship them out that is what kind of keeps keg connection standalone even into 2022 if you read the descriptions on most retailers it says dumped only right and they just ship it out that way what, exactly what, what, what's yeah. your what was your process then because you'd save a lot of time if you didn't clean them like why did you always have the philosophy of wanting to ship these out cleaned 
I just, I just feel like it's, you know, they're all different degrees. And, and the, the reason is this guy right here. So, you know, 90% of the time we're going to ship them out. They're going to have a little soda you rinse them out. But what about, what about when you send some guy one and it's got dead wasp and, you know, rat, a rat floating in the bottom of it? I mean, that guy's going to be upset, right? So I just feel like I want to get them good and clean and send them out that way. And now we, we still get complaints when we clean them. And a lot of times it's because a little bit of that brew clean stays in there and it actually forms kind of a Sprite smell, uh, like the soda Sprite. And, uh, people call up and say, ah, oh, you said you cleaned this keg, but it, it obviously it smells like Sprite. Y'all didn't even rinse it out, you know? And, uh, and it can also, you know, you can get a little, maybe something's in the dip tube when you're done and you get, you get a, a little off color that, that falls down. There's a few drops of that. And people feel like they weren't clean, which in a way is a mistake. Cause we're supposed to, we always open up the dip tubes and then you're supposed to open them again when you, when you rinse uh, to get everything out of there. But yeah, we, we, we clean them. We clean them pretty good before we, sh- before we ship them out. So I also want to give credit to brew clean, the powder cleanser that you had uh, developed with Logic Ink, uh, uh, what it's probably been thirteen years ago. It's been a long time, but yeah, long because, time like for in this case for Matt, what I would say, he if he if he you know replacing all the gaskets is a very cheap and obvious fix as well. Take all the components that can come up. Take the post off, pops out, whatever. Soak everything in brew clean along with your keg, and that you're going to get it to basically everything like that. That brew clean takes off beer stone and and gunk and all that as it's soaking in very very hot water for an hour at, at minimum uh yeah yeah right and then you just so. reassemble yeah. it and you're ba- not basically brand new that's an uh, exaggeration a little but you're as good as as that keg is going to get cleanliness wise and then obviously sanitize it before you put your beer in there and you're good to go right yeah, and you're living proof that it's safe because the last time we had a rat in a keg, I you gave it to I me. cleaned it out really good and put your beer in it. So, I, know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know the things you do. I know. And and also, I, th- I thought you were going to actually jab me about the cleaning part because or, or the swapping parts out because you, you always use me. At, like when I first started working for you, you had a, a linear uh, scale of Neanderthal up to Einstein and you're like right. we got to make sure the process is for the Neanderthal side so it's easy to understand but then every time you want to no, make an no ex- offense to Neanderthals no and, no I'm we, we got to be politically correct I'm the Neanderthal you're referring to cuz every time we just the CM Becker regulators you you have a station for assembling them and you're like Josh get in here okay read the instructions I'm going to show you once and let's see if you can make it and you're timing me while I'm doing it and in my head I'm thinking Oh, he's doing the Neanderthal test again. And then you even said it when I was done. I did it in like t- two minutes, right? And you uh-huh. did it in like 90 seconds, of course. But I did it in like two minutes. And you, the first thing you said was, okay, everyone, if Josh can do it, if we can do it. Like that was your feedback. <laughs> and you do that with Keds too when I was swapping out posts one time. Oh, Josh can do it. Anyone can do it. You know, sometimes it hurts. You know, when I Google Neanderthal, <laughs> the very first image it po- Google it and look at the very first. I can't. Image. My computer's taking up. Uh, and it, and it, it <clears throat> literally looks like you. <laughs> I mean, your beard shaved a little more, but same forehead. Oh, James, do you remember when you and I toured? I do. How I had that video. The tour, we toured the <laughs> Smithsonian for <laughs> CBC kickoff, and one of the things that the Smithsonian was, "What would you look like as early human?" And it didn't change my photo. <laughs> <laughs> It just it did. To be fair, it did. It just added some but hair. It was funny because I had brought up the fact that it didn't change much. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. Just, it took my face and put some hair on my cheeks, like those wolf boys in Peru. It, it removed the blue hat. And it so. removed the hat. Yeah. It was yeah. see it was there is that's evidence that my hat used to be turquoise and then when they <laughs> released the purple line of the Verano from uh, Sendero then I started I switched over to the purple line. Hey, but, you're not wearing that hat today, are you? No, I can't find it right now. I think my wife may have hit it. Uh, that's my go-to every time I'm missing something. I think my wife hit it. I can't find. It. I did wear my serial killer shirt for you again, though. You made fun nice. of it the other day, and so I had wait a to- minute. Didn't you wear that yesterday? Uh, was it yesterday? Or was it two days ago? I just saw it in my bag as I was unpacking. I go, oh, I got to wear it for the podcast. 
It feels okay. yeah. I don't care. Do you not wear I mean I chair I, I change chonies every day. I don't always change shirts. Do you change like if you're just at home, you, you don't wear the same thing more day, multiple days? Uh, whatever. You're judgmental. So Matt, wrapping up your question. Um no man, stainless steel, you're good to go. Now it's a bummer that you received the keg like that. And in my opinion, I would let that retailer know that you don't appreciate that because i think retailers should spend a little bit more effort especially with the keg stuff i see it on the reddit threads all the time i see it on facebook groups for people who do kegerators and teasers and stuff where like oh i ordered it a great deal blah 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 but here's my complaint list now and it's all stuff that's like well that's why it came to you as cheap as it did because they didn't do anything but take it off a truck and then put it in the box going out to you so you just read the fine print when you're ordering kegs friends that's what i'll say just know what you're getting if if the website says that they're not cleaning it trust them they're not cleaning it so but but again to be fair it, it, cleaning it, it it's a little bit more work but it's not the end of the world and you can get that keg up and running just fine i i there, i've never seen anything in a keg that made me not uh believe that we couldn't use the keg but i don't remember the dead rat one i may have prospectively been like mm, let's not use that one but like todd said he had no problem using it for my beer so that I, was- I didn't want to send it to a customer yeah you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm always the guinea pig. I got it. So thank you, Matt, so much for submitting that question. Moving on to question number two. It is a text message from our buddy Vince who wrote, how much headspace is too much in my C10? That's from Spike, their conical fermenter. Uh, Does it matter? This is a, a, a great question. I got some flack when I took a photo of my beer fermenting in the, um, in your in your fermenter, Todd, when we split up that batch to do the testing with Jonathan, of of um, it was in the not fermenter king. What are the other ones called? Bruzilla or Firmzilla? And because we did a seventeen gallon batch, but it was split between all these vessels, so that big old fifteen point nine gallon vessel had all this headspace. James, what is the dangers of allowing too much headspace, or is it much ado about nothing and it doesn't matter? Oh, I could go go through, get into the uh, airlock, or go out the blow off tube, and uh, potentially, if it's bad enough, it can contaminate the 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 wart. That's allowing too much headspace. Yeah, it's just it, the whole thing about sealing with an airlock is you keep the keep anything from coming in. Uh, you let stuff out, but nothing in. But if you push enough foam and krausen through an airlock, that it I've had airlocks where I pushed it. It pushed all the liquid out, and uh, luckily it didn't didn't contaminate the the wart. But it is certainly a possibility. Oh, but you but you're talking about not enough headspace. You're talking about like oh, you're saying too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Duh, he, I yeah. should listen. No, to no, the no, no, no. You're too. good because I was gonna get us to let, let's start there. Todd push has been lately, in my opinion, pushing the limits on on headspace or lack of headspace. But you've not had yeah. an issue, Todd. And why do you think that is? Um. You know, the my the fermenter that I use the most is is the one from Spike and it's got space above the the way that the lid goes on, it has more space up there. Oh, so you okay, because you've been pushing it like it, it what is the total volume of it? It's like um seven like, and a half gallons or yeah, something and like you that. Put I don't 17 remember exactly. In it. Yeah, yeah. And you, but you haven't had any backflow issues because you're. I've seen your blow off tubes before where they're just motor potent like crazy. Yeah. And so it's obviously pushing a lot of air through. You haven't had any. Obviously, you haven't had any contamination no, I haven't issues. Had any issues. We would have brought it up on the show. I'd love to throw you under the bus for contamination, but, but like what you said, James, is it can happen if if it's pushing liquid out and all that to to yeah. bring contaminant back in, right? But he's wanting to know about is is it possible to have too much airspace? But you got to think when that's when that yeast is going to town it's going to still slowly start pushing the whatever oxygen was in there when you closed it up no i think you're fine as long as it's sealed and and you have a good solid seal and it's just when it goes to town it goes to fermenting it's pushing co2 out it yeah it's going to make a lot of co2 so you don't have to worry about it that's my understanding as well and i don't know anyone who doesn't purge their fermenting fermentation vessel before they use it anyway so that that purging of Wait, what do you mean by that i mean you don't, oh don't you don't put uh oh i'm sorry that would be during the no transfer. you can't you want no that'd be like secondary. Yeah, you want, you no, want no 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 you're right yeah. i'm thinking of when we do secondary <laughs> transfers we purge out the yeah. the carboy with the hose you're right during primary you don't want to purge nothing you you that's why todd is is on the ladder 
uh, way above the thing, letting it splash. Because you're right, you want oxygen in the primary, mm-hmm. and as it's fermenting, it's pushing it out and upwards as it's creating the CO2. Yep. Yeah, I had to cover my ass there for a second before I looked like <laughs> a real idiot <laughs> or bigger idiot. The look on Todd's face said it though. For you, I saw a juggler. Yeah. <laughs> you were coming for me you're like yeah ju- wait no see you weren't clever enough though because if i was if i were you i would have been like yeah tell us more about this purging of the primary fermenter josh how do you do that uh, what's the thought process behind it and then I no, maybe you should tell people how you do that yeah. exactly <laughs> no you're right there the um head so there is not you can't have too much headspace is what y'all are saying because of the creation of co2 during the primary fermentation yeah yep Okay, and and I'm assuming though, if you're doing it under pressure, would that change y'all's thoughts? Because it's still it's still pushing CO2. Okay, it's okay. wanting to push. It'll still vent CO2 at some point in time. Okay, because that's the only thing I could think of is man, if you fill all too much space with CO2, would that affect it? Um, in a way that would be you know tangibly well think about it if you've got a regular keg and you're drafting the the keg of beer when it gets it gets half empty it's it's getting still getting pushed with co2 the same thing that's happening if you're pressure fermenting and uh let's say you're doing five gallons in a 10 gallon conical which i think that cf10 is 14 gallons total so it doesn't matter it's it's getting filled up with co2 and and that's perfect right perfectly on. fine so you would say james then you're more likely to have issues from filling it too much as opposed to pushing okay. yeah pushing the capacity of the fermenter i've done it i've been guilty of it <laughs> well on, many on, times on y'all cf15 because i can't imagine on on your bids on your big uh, no i did it on big birth no we did way five gallon batch one time and i had a i had a cone of trub foam coming <laughs> up down the, we had a bucket of water next to it and it would just made a big. I come home from work, and there was a column of it looked like uh, whipped cream coming I mean, up. I, it's still, I don't think, I mean, you know, one of the co- concerns he has is getting contaminated. But it, uh, as long as you stopped it before it started, I mean, it's not going to go backwards until you're done with fermentation, right? Yeah, once you're it, once it's active, when it's active fermenting, there's always positive pressure inside the conical or whatever you're fermenting. But it's when the fermentation's over and everything equalizes is when you'll get a little suck back. Or if you do a cold, cold, you know, you, you, you bring it cold. What's the term? Cold crash. <laughs> cold crash. Yeah. When you cold crash, <laughs> you'll get, you'll get sucked back too. So yeah, that you I just see, gotta watch that. Yeah. You do got to watch that. I've seen people, especially I've seen people have these plastic ones, um, uh, collapse during cold crash. And that, mm-hmm. that seems terrifying. If you don't keep the positive pressure applied, I guess, is what you're having to do to avoid that. That's a whole different topic anyways to talk about. But um, thank you, Vince, so much for submitting the question. Yeah, shout out to Spite. Those CF lines are, are brilliant. We have we have two of them now, or I say now, one in our master brew room at the headquarters and then one at Todd's place. And th- those things hold up. And, well, And speaking of hold up, like you said, Bit Bertha, which what do we call it now? Um Fermenter the hut. It looks like pizza the <laughs> yeah. hut from after your yeah. uh, after your uh, caulking job. It doesn't have the 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 double size lid that we used to. And it was always leaking. That was the one thing about it is I wasn't real happy with the way they provided a seal. There was two arrows on the top lid in the conical. You had to line them up, and it had a rubber gasket that fit between them. We we hard. It seemed like every time we used it at full capacity, it would leak. But you but I think they've it. since changed that. But because uh, I bought that thing in 2010, I was just saying it was it was a long time ago. Isn't it wild seeing how equipment has changed since you started brewing, or for both y'all mm-hmm. in regards to the availability? And I love that Spike and and uh, Blickman and SS Brewtech and More Beer with their brew built as the name of their brand. Like the, all of them are competing for this niche space so it's causing innovation i think at a more rapid rate than when y'all were brewing in the early 2000s and late 90s and todd in the 40s or whenever you were born and started brewing uh (laughs) the innovation though i love seeing it because it's like a new product release every other year of like something super in, uh, uh, innovating and uh even if it's just like the way that they're redoing pressure relief valves or whatever it's been cool to see and i think i say it all the time best time alive to be best time to be alive as a home brewer am i right mr burns 
Yes, absolutely. I am right. I know it. So thank you so much, Vince, for submitting that question. Our third and final question, we're blowing through this show, came from our buddy Craig, who used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Craig wrote, fellas, you talk about storing dry malt extract, but how do you feel about liquid malt extract? I have a chance at buying it in bulk for cheap. Almost too good to be true for the price I'm getting it for. What could go wrong with buying it in bulk? I love the podcast and videos. Cheers, Craig. The only thing I can think of is doesn't doesn't uh, liquid have uh, expiration? It has a shelf life. It has a it shelf is, life yeah. that dry. Yeah. D- what well, does dry does dry have a shelf life? Because I've never. Well, I've, I've you I've had it frozen in my freezer at home and used it, and I think as long as you keep it frozen and because in a freezer it's really dry environment, which is key. I, I think that I would if I was going to do long term storage, I wouldn't use anything but dry malt extract in a freezer than I would liquid. Right, li- and liquid, not that the expiration dates are always spot on, because we've used year plus it's expired, quote unquote expired uh, liquid that worked out just fine and didn't provide any off flavors or anything. But but it is a much shorter short life, uh, shelf life, right? Because you're not able to freeze it without affecting it. and uh, Or can you freeze? Actually, I've, I'm saying uh, that. I might be speaking I've, out of turn. Can you freeze liquid malt? I've, I've never, I've only had dry. If I've had liquid, it was a long time ago and I was using it fairly quick but. oh super quick right like you yeah. didn't buy it with the intent of storing it like you do mm-hmm. for dry yeast or dry malt extract todd what are you looking up are you looking up the are you cheating uh no 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 i I was gonna give everybody an update when you're done with this question oh well so. well, well well give us your input though on this I, obviously if we had to choose buying bulk dme versus lme we're picking dme all day because we're experienced yeah. with storing it and like you said as long as you keep it in a dry environment and or freezing it which is also the dry environment it's going to last pretty much forever todd what are your thoughts on buying lme in bulk and then trying to store it I would, I would just use, I mean, you'd have to use it pretty quick. It, it, it definitely will go bad in, in time. Uh, you know, the other thing too, when you say in bulk, I don't really know what that means. If you're buying a hundred three point three pound bottles, then that's a lot better than if you bought right. a giant. Yeah, well, like you know, they sell it. I think at thirty and fifty gallon. Yep. Well, mm-hmm. you know, when you open that up you know, you're going to, it's going to deteriorate faster than it, than it, than it does when it's all sealed up. That's so. a great point. You're right. Cause if you're buying it in the 3.3s, the ones you're not using won't have exposure to oxygen and being unsealed until in theory you're using them. So that would be yeah. the more, but you're right. I didn't ask Craig, I'll, I'll reach back out. And if I can get a follow up, um, I'll, I'll tell I you. I think all. the, the biggest thing with liquid malt extract is it, it is possible if you like, let's say Todd used to order those. I want to say that with two and a half gallon jugs for some uh, reason, I, or was yeah, it three? They, uh, they were big old plastic jugs and we'd think, open and pour. Yeah. Uh, but over half, time, I think, or yeah. I think it was fives that are, that were upstairs. Were they fives? I, I yeah. Think, yeah. Maybe I think, it was five. Or maybe it was three. No, no, well, no. You're right. Cause they weren't that big, but they were big enough. Yeah. The thing about it is, is that once they're open, they're really liquid malt extracts prone to oxidation. You can really taste it in the beer. That's an excellent point. You're right. And I imagine when people say bulk, I always assume it's it's going to be like that, James. Like it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe that's why he's saying it's too good to be true. My pop always said if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Maybe those yeah. the people selling it to him realize we got nothing to do with this thing. And as soon as we open it, we got to use it and we have no reason to use it. So, because what, what, well, I say, I was about to ask what recipe could use three and a half gallons uh, at a time, but what was that Kolsch that y'all did uh, 17 gallons of, or however big, how, how many, ga- how, how, how much liquid did y'all use for that? We used dry. We used oh, dry I'm stupid. Y'all yeah. used a whole, like basically a whole sack of it too, right? We thought we had a whole bunch of dry up there and we ended up, <laughs> Using all the dry we had left. Yep. Hey, I tell you what, though, that Kolsch turned out good. It's probably my my favorite extract beer y'all have ever brewed or that we've ever brewed collectively over the years. It, and it mellowed out. The first time I tried it that you had it on the Chronicle still, which was, I don't know, a month ago or two, two and a half weeks ago, you, you pointed it out. And I was like, yeah, it, it does have that extract kind of um taste to it where you're like yeah it's not bad but yeah you could tell it's that strat it that that taste is gone like it, it, in yeah, the keg. it just needed a condition so and it could have been something else you know i was really happy with the way it turned out 
Yeah, I was super happy. And we're going to have that uh, two and a half ca- keg, two and a half gallon keg. I can't talk today on, on tap at the party Saturday. I'm excited to share it because Kolsch, even my family knows me as the Kolsch guy in, in regards to what I enjoy. Now, right. if most of them listen to the show because if they didn't, I was going to absolutely take credit for all of the beer that's on tap when they're like, enjoying it from their Steubing's brow house glass. But Josh, great beer. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, it was no problem at all. No hassle to me. It's actually your beer, Todd, and then three of James's. So I won't have any. I have a little bit of last year's breakfast stout I could put on tap, but then I'd have to yeah. share it. I don't want to do you that. You should brew sometime. I should brew sometime. I know. I've been I've been uh, saying that, and then I don't. Because y'all keep brewing so much, and, and I'm enjoying your beer. It's a it's a little life hack I recommend to everybody involved. But yeah. anyways, uh, is the consensus, Todd, you think that – maybe think twice about buying it bulk unless it is in the 3.3 pound packaging that we would do for recipes when we were in the recipe game uh yeah even those uh, you know i mean eventually it's gonna they're, they're gonna go bad i mean there, there's expiration dates on them that it's um yeah eventually they're gonna go bad so i and i and i don't know about dry i think if you left dry out the problem you're going to run into with dry is that if it's not perfectly sealed, it starts to uh, cake up, you know, get, if yep. it gets wet at oh, all. Oh, yeah, so. any moisture. Oh, we've seen it when we're using whatever for a recipe. But like I said, yeah, yeah between the two, I think we all agree, James, uh, if you had to buy one or the other, do DME. And yeah, maybe it is too good to be true, Craig, about the liquid. But you're an adult. Do whatever you want. That's what I told yeah, Todd. Yeah, just check the, check the born on date or the date it was packaged, and, and you can make your decision from there. Absolutely. So, Craig, thank you so much for submitting the question. Fellas, that's all I've got for y'all for this week. I appreciate y'all's time. It was good seeing y'all in person, and I'll see y'all next time I'm up there. All right. Oh, uh, oh, your you, update. You oh, you're up. Oh, hold okay. on. I'm not editing that out. Todd, what is the update you wanted to tell everybody? I was just going to say that when we talked about the 3470, I had to look it up. It's uh, cellular, cellular science, German dry lager yeast from more beer is the one we were referring to. That's the one we used in that, re- in those recipes. So, okay. Yeah. And it worked real good. It had really good attenuation, uh, no issues. Uh, they got a fantastic price on it too. Did you try repitching with it or have you not done that yet? Haven't done. No. Do you, any, no, any I, plans? I to? did this. And oh, I yeah, you're, oh, since. That's right. <laughs> How, we need an update on that. How's your hand? Weekly update. It's it gets better. I just gotta quit using it and give it time to heal. I'm not gonna be able to brew with my neck like this either. So it's gonna be oh, all up to you now. Now Josh. it's about to fall on me. See, all <laughs> up to you. The universe is giving me signs through y'all's failing bodies. I love yep. it. Yep. <laughs> Thank you guys for your time. I'll talk to y'all Thanks. later. Thanks. Bye bye. And Later. that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss on a future episode. Go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page, or you can call, leave a voicemail, and be Todd's bestest of friends at 325-305-6107. Hey, get a free pack of delicious and premium imperial yeast along with our recipes when you join the Trub Club. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrewhappyhour and come brew with us. On behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening. 